Review Group, Mr. Alec Maskey, to move the motion. Mr. Maskey. Uh, Gorm Maggot, Kieran Kiorla. Um, gives me uh, pleasure this morning, uh, Kieran Kiorla, to uh, move this motion on the uh, work of the uh, committee system, of, or rather of the uh, CRG, uh, looking at the committee system. Uh, the need for this particular review, Kieran came from a recommendation made by the Assembly and Executive Review Committee that it would be verdict as prudent for the Assembly to make an early start to a review of the Assembly Committee system and that the Chairperson's Liaison Group should have an important role in this review. End quote. On the foot of this recommendation, the terms of reference for a review of the Committee system were agreed by the CLG, Chairperson Liaison Group. The review was undertaken by a Committee Review Group, uh, made up of one uh, Chairperson from each of the political parties represented on the CLG and three expert advisors. The expert advisors were Dr. Ruth Fox, Head and, Head and Director of Research, Hans Art Society, Mr. Art O'Leary, Secretary, Constitutional Convention, Ireland, Mr. Trevor Reaney, Clerk, Director General of the Northern Ireland Assembly. And I would like to take this opportunity Concord, to express my thanks on behalf of the CRG to the expert advisors and all of the other staff and officials for sharing their expertise and contributing so willingly to the particular review. In undertaking this review, the CRG met regularly over a six-month period. Uh, we commissioned research on committee systems and other legislatures and considered briefing papers on membership turnover scenarios with different numbers of committees and members. In addition to the research and discussion papers, CRG, of course, drew on the experience and the knowledge of the members themselves. I would like to point out that while previous committee reviews have been undertaken in the past, this was the first such review to take an integrated approach across all aspects of the committee system. In addition to reviewing the structure of the committee system, CRG also looked at options to enhance the Assembly's policy development, scrutiny, consultation and legislative rules in the short to medium term. The group focused its deliberations on developing uh, a vision and principles for the committee system, identifying and evaluating the strengths and weaknesses in the committee system and recommending areas for improvement. CRG provided regular updates to CLG on the progress and emerging findings of the review. We also consulted with the five political parties represented on the CRG with regard to the emerging findings and outline proposals. Having looked at examples of other committee systems nationally and internationally, CRG was largely content with the overall architecture of the current committee system. Key strengths identified were that committees have a wide remit with powers to call ministers and departments to account, hold inquiries and shape legislation. Informally, committees also have significant influence that was felt in their relevant sphere of policy and apparently do compare favourably with other uh, uh, legislatures. Committees are also accessible and have a high level of engagement with the public. This is evident by the number of external visits and meetings that committees undertake and the innovative ways in which committees engage and collect evidence. And I think this is something which is fair to say is not widely acknowledged. CRG was mindful of the prevailing political and constitutional climate as part of which there has been a considerable debate about proposals to reduce the number of MLAs and to reorganise and reduce perhaps the number of uh, departments. CRG agrees that this will have clear implications for the committee structure. CRG therefore concluded that it would not be prudent at this stage to propose any fundamental changes to the committee system of the Assembly. But within this context, CRG considered what aspects of the committee system it wished to retain and what aspects it identified as benefiting from improvement or enhancement. For example, a major conclusion of the review was that the link between each committee, each, uh, committee and uh, a, 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 a single executive department should be retained. The organisation of statutory committees, which mirrors the machinery of government, is regarded as a key strength by the CRG and finds its origins clearly in the Belfast Agreement, Good Friday Agreement. The ability of a committee to provide direct oversight of an executive department and its ministerial team underpins a committee's capacity to conduct focused and effective scrutiny. And considering the case for change, CRG looked at other legislatures where the committee uh, structure is based on thematic policy areas or where committees cover a multitude of departmental briefs. However, in these cases, the committee can find it difficult to hold the relevant minister and department to account. CRG also noted that the Assembly framework of one committee for each department is built to accommodate the consociational framework for committees. The chairpersons of statutory committees are from a different political party than the corresponding minister, and this clear delineation may be blurred if committees were merged. This could be detrimental, in fact, to the independence of the committee in question. However, in coming to this conclusion, uh, CRG did agree that there would be merit in revisiting these structural issues in 2015 in advance of the anticipated changes in 2016. 
CRG also agreed that the current composition of committees is in broad proportion to party strength in the Assembly and therefore recommends that statutory committee membership should be retained at 11. However, this should also be reviewed in advance of any institutional changes in 2016. By proposing no major structural changes, CRG does recognise that this consequently places limits on the scope and extent of other proposals that it can recommend at this time. In terms of power, CRG considered whether any aspect of committee work would benefit from the creation of additional powers, but concluded that committees are equipped with adequate powers as they are currently uh, situated. While CRG did not see any value in extending committee powers to amend legislation, it did agree that committees could do more to ensure potential amendments are fully discussed and considered at committee stage and reported to the Assembly. While acknowledging that committees have sufficient powers, CRG did agree that a key constraining factor uh, to more effective and strategic working is that committee, committees face too many demands with limited resources and capacity to fully utilise those powers. A number of measures were discussed to address how to make the best use of committee powers and resources. This included recommendations to improve the operation of meetings and attendance, strengthening existing protocols between the Executive and the Assembly, to improve the quality and timeliness of information to committees by departments, and for the Assembly to initiate a dialogue with the Executive on protocols to improve appropriate access to ministers and or officials. A key theme running throughout the review was the need for committees to apply a more strategic and systematic approach to their work. Members agreed that there would be value in exploring how to develop a more strategic approach to the planning of committee business, prioritise specific areas of work and allowing capacity uh, for a particular issues to be explored in greater depth. To support this approach, CRG recommends that a set of core tasks should be developed to guide committees' forward work programmes and that committees should develop strategic plans to set out as key priorities, objectives, targets within a core task framework. The committee review group considered the role of the chairperson liaison group and did not see merit in formalising its role in standing order. However, it did agree that the role of CLG could be expanded and that it could be, effective, could be an effective mechanism to support committees in adopting a more strategic and systematic approach to their forward work programmes. However, as a point of principle, while CRG does see the benefit of standard procedures and adopting best practice, they are also keen to maintain the autonomy of each committee in determining its own forward work programme and priorities. And finally, while the CRG concluded that public engagement is a key strength of the committee system of the Assembly, uh, it also identified a need for committees to maximise the use of new and existing technologies to engage to an even greater extent with the wider public and what are described as hard to reach groups. Uh, I now will pass over to my other uh, committee review, review group uh, colleagues to outline in some more detail some of the other issues and recommendations uh, detailed in the report. And on that note, I formally move the motion. Thank you. Michelle McElveen. Ms. McElveen. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I welcome this review and endorse the recommendations in the report. I'd also like to take the opportunity to thank all the staff involved in producing the report. Um, and whilst others will um, look at other aspects of this report, in particular, I'd like to draw attention to the review's work in relation to public engagement. This was identified as a key strength of the committee system of the Assembly. Committees are already doing much to engage with the public, demonstrated by the number of external meetings, online broadcasting and access, stakeholder events and the increasing use of social media networking sites. Sadri committees undertake a wide range of activities from formal weekly meetings to external meetings, visits and stakeholder events. Committees strive to be accessible and in addition to holding formal committees in parliament buildings, undertake meetings and visits in a multitude of venues and locations across Northern Ireland. Now, whilst 81% of visits undertaken by committees are in Northern Ireland, committees are doing much more to be accessible beyond Parliament buildings and um, Northern Ireland. And I think it's fair to say that the evidence backs up the claim that committees are committed to ensuring that as many people as possible have an opportunity to take part in the work of the Assembly and to opening up opportunities for local communities to um, influence the work of committees. As seen, for example, by the Joint Committee's visit in June and October of this year, when 14 of our committees took part in two joint visits to Londonderry to mark the UK City of Culture. Assembly committees have become known for using innovative methods of engaging with their stakeholders. There are numerous examples of where committees have successfully used a range of both internal stakeholder events in Parliament buildings and external venues to target its engagement with key stakeholders, including children and young people, academic and educational institutions, 
and key interest groups in the private, voluntary and community sectors. These are examples of committees not only engaging with the public, but committees doing much more collaborative working across a number of cross-cutting issues, such as health, justice and education, culture, arts and leisure and environment. CRG, however, has identified a need for committees to maximise the use of new and existing technologies to engage to an even greater extent with the wider public and hard-to-reach groups. Also, a strategic balance needs to be struck between facilitating as many stakeholder groups and meetings as possible and ensuring that maximum value is extracted from each one in the interests of both members and the public. The need for this balance should be considered as part of each committee's strategic plan and the emerging work programme that results. Now, although not part of its terms of reference, concerns were raised about the operation of all party groups at the Assembly. In particular, there is concern about the growth of APGs and how this could impact on committee business. Frustrations have been ex expressed about the scheduling of APGs and when these clash with formal committee business, given that committees are already stretched this place further pressure on members' time. Concern was also expressed about the inappropriate use of APGs, and this is in relation to the Secretariat for these groups, which are not member-led, but which can lead to issues around transparency, agenda setting, and the control of access to APGs. There is also concern about the appointment of secretariats and how they can create, this can create the perception of hierarchy within sectors whereby the group administering the APG could be seen as being favoured. There are currently 35 APGs registered that are researching issues and putting forward proposals outside the formal committee network. CRG considered whether there should be a limit on the number of APGs in light of ongoing concerns in relation to transparency. I therefore welcome the recommendations by the review that the issue of the number and governance of APGs and their secretariats, including their role and appointment process, is referred to the Committee for Standards and Privileges. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, thanks very much, Mr Speaker. Um, I welcome this review and endorse the recommendations in the report. In particular, I would like to draw attention specifically to the need for committees to manage their resources more efficiently and effectively and use committee powers to greater effect. As the Chair has already outlined, uh, CRG concluded that there was no need to expand committee powers. However, there is an issue in that committees are not always making the most use and the best use of the powers that they have. This can be largely down to limited resources and heavy work programmes. One way of dealing with this is for committees to take greater control of their agenda and work programmes. Indeed, uh, this has been alluded to the benefits of adopting a more strategic approach to work programmes as one way of dealing with this. In terms of making the most of committee powers, committees can be extremely influential. For example, the statutory power to compel the production of persons or papers confirms the important role that committees play in ensuring, ensuring accountability, but it is notable that this power has not yet been exercised to its fullest extent. While this may be due to the fact that the threat of invoking the power is sufficient, or on a more positive note, it could also be a reflection of the general positive, productive and professional relationships that committees have established with stakeholders, including departments, sometimes usually by experience on the behalf of those departments, but nevertheless having served on PAC, uh, that sends out a very sharp message. However, whilst it is fair to say that committees are normally successful at obtaining the information they require, one factor that can have an adverse effect on this positive relationship is the late delivery of requested papers by departments, giving members insufficient time to consider them before questioning witnesses. And indeed, I can reflect on the ETI committee uh, just a fortnight ago, where we received papers, I think, 10 months late. Uh, and those came from OFM DFM. Late access to budget papers and departmental delivery plans have been quoted as examples of when the capacity of committees to fulfil their statutory functions has been adversely affected. While there are protocols in place on timescales for interaction between assembly committees and departments, CRG recommends that CLG should strengthen the protocols between the executive and the assembly to ensure the quality and timeliness of information provided to committee by departments. 
Another issue that the CRG looked at was access to relevant officials to appear before the committees and the departmental controls of this. There have been indeed instances where a committee may have had difficulty in gaining access to an official best placed or most suited to, uh, relevant, to provide the relevant assistance and indeed detail to those committees in their inquiries. And because of departmental machinations and transfer of staff, that person was not made available. Further problems can arise when officials have indeed moved on, and as a result, the full facts, as they were at that time, are difficult to establish, and the chain of accountability can, in fact, become blurred. CRG recognises that it is normally appropriate for ministers to determine who should represent them at committees. However, it also concluded that from time to time, committees should be able to request and, if necessary, insist on the attendance of specific officials or indeed ministers to assist them in their inquiries. I therefore strongly support the recommendation that the Assembly initiates a dialogue with the Executive in order to agree protocols about appropriate access to officials and or ministers in pursuit of full accountability. The issue of resources was also discussed at length by committees and the challenges it presents to committees. There is no doubt that committees consume a large amount of members' time and that of ministers, departmental officials and stakeholders. And just as an example of that, committees have held 1,182 meetings from the beginning of the current mandate until June 2013. On average, committee meetings last approximately two and a half hours, and it is estimated that almost 3,000 hours of time is devoted to attending committee meetings. In addition, committee travel to external venues for meetings, undertake visits, uh, hold stakeholder events, and attend informal meetings. This increases the time commitment required by members, but it was regarded as a very important aspect of committee work as it allows greater access to committees and assists committees in, in understanding and, and indeed members and exploring a range of issues that cannot always be covered with, within the formal committee proceedings. Uh, I, I support the report. Thank you. Thank you. David Hillis. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Anna Lowe. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I, I uh, welcome the report. Uh, the CRG discussed the importance of committees needing to be more strategic on several occasions. I would like to say a few words uh, on the recommendations regarding strategic planning. We recognise committee work plans by necessity are often dictated by the timetable for scrutiny of legislation and regulations, and they therefore tend to follow the pace of the Department's For Work Work program. However, we also recognise that committees need to have a wider perspective on what they do and how they link into each other's policies and objectives as a whole. I support the recommendations that CLG should define a set of core tasks to assist with strategic and systematic planning, including scrutiny of a uh, program for government as well as post-legislative uh, scrutiny, which is an issue the Environment Committee has referred to many times. The CRG also recommends that committees should develop a strategic plan that sets out its key priorities, objectives, targets and planned outputs within the core task framework. Many businesses or voluntary sector organisations do that on a regular basis to give them the direction of travel to achieve their set goals. And why shouldn't we? Another recommendation is that planning day or days should be held to inform the strategic approach of the committee at the start of each assembly session. The Environment Committee has fully embraced uh, this suggestion, Mr. Speaker, and held our first planning day in Lochney Discovery Centre on the 19th of September, holding it as a formal meeting, which was also minuted. The, the minutes set out in some detail the format of the meeting as well as uh, the agreed outcomes, and they provide a concise and publicly available record of what the committee hopes to achieve over the coming year. 
This was a useful outcome of holding uh, the planning day as a formal meeting, albeit in closed session. As I know, some of the other committees did not do this and subsequently found it difficult to ratify the decisions taken at an informal planning away day. The use of a location outside Parliament buildings was worthwhile, uh, particularly one which allowed much more informal engagement between members than our usual venue of the Senate chamber. It also meant that there were fewer distractions, uh, such as long gallery events, as we all know, uh, for members. Uh, we also found it useful to have this planning day as a predetermined date for considering the committee's workload. This meant that members were able to flag up areas which they believed were worth more detailed scrutiny. Members were then confident that these, these issues would not be lost uh, in the pressure of business in the coming days. I think we also discussed the need for preparation before the planning day. We needed to identify the mandatory areas of our work, such as the scrutiny of legislation, and then decide other possible areas of focus. We had to clarify and agree on the scope and time scale of these areas. For example, the committee debated which, if any, inquiry should be undertaken, and after considering a number of possible topics, it was agreed that a short scrutiny into wind energy should be undertaken before Christmas and that a more detailed inquiry into water quality in Lockney should happen later on next year. In order to fully consider these, an adequate level of background information was provided in the meeting pack for the planning meeting. This structure uh, structured and uh, methodol uh, methodol no, and methodical and methodical uh, approach. I need my glasses, Mr. Speaker. I'm just too vain. <laughs> uh, yes, no, 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 no. Defeat the purpose. <laughs> so the uh, this structured and methodical approach ensure that the planning day did not degenerate into an undisciplined expression of wish lists, which uh, uh, with, with no Members factual background or evidence. So I therefore recommend a good planning day to all committees. David Hillis, Deputy Chair of the Audit Committee. Mr Hillis. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker, and I, I welcome the opportunity to contribute to this debate and raise as Vice Chair of the Audit Committee. The report of the Committee Review Group talks about expanding the role of the Audit Committee, and I, I want to set out the Audit Committee's position in relation to the principles underpinning this recommendation. It has been the long-standing position of the Audit Committee that the Northern Ireland Audit Office is not just independent of the Executive, but actually responsible for scrutinising the financial performance of its departments, and it should not have to rely on the Executive for its funding. It is already the case that the Northern Ireland Act recognises this uh, in that it provides for the Audit Committee in place of DFP to agree the annual estimates of the Audit Office and lay before the Assembly. The Audit Committee has sought on various occasions to have this principle reinforced in the budget process and looks forward to that being the case in the forthcoming Memorandum of Understanding on the budget process between the Executive and the Assembly. Of course, given that the Ombudsman and the Assembly are also independent of the Executive and in their respective ways responsible for holding the Executive and its departments to account, it is sensible that similar mechanisms should be put in place to ensure their financial independence. The Audit Committee had actually looked at the issue earlier this year and last year. At that time, we wrote to the Committee of the Office of First and Deputy First Minister to confirm that we were content with the Audit that the Audit Committee should agree the annual estimate of the use of resources for the proposed Northern Ireland Public Service Ombudsman. The recommendation in today's report is consistent with our position on this. Of course, just because a body is financially independent of the Executive does not mean that it should be any less accountable. As a result, the Audit Committee is committed to ensuring that the Northern Ireland Audit Office is fully accountable to the Assembly for its financial performance. In fact, the chairperson of the Audit Committee is in Westminster today uh, meeting with the Public Accounts Commission to see if there are any lessons to learn from the new government arrangements in place at the National Audit Office. Equally, if the role of the Audit Committee is expanded to cover the Ombudsman 
and the Assembly, it will be important to ensure that these bodies continue to be accountable for their financial performance. The report today also talks about how the secretarial support for this new single committee should be managed within existing secretariat resources. I welcome this. When the Audit Committee agreed that it should agree the annual estimate of the Ombudsman uh, for the use of resources, it did not anticipate that the significant additional resource would be required. It is important, particularly in the current climate, for our reforms to be at least cost neutral where possible. Mr. Speaker, on behalf of the Audit Committee, I welcome the recommendations in today's report in relation to expand the Committee's rule. Thank you. Alistair Ross. Mr. Ross. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I welcome the opportunity to speak on this report today. I do so um, as chairperson of the, the Committee on Standards and Privileges because, uh, although the, the committee was not um, formally um, consulted or involved in, in this, uh, this review, there are a few issues contained within the report that are relevant to the work of, of our committee. Um, on page 30 of the report, paragraphs 149 to 152 in particular, uh, around the issue of all party groups, has been outlined by my colleague, Ms. McElveen. Uh, within the report, there are concerns. Um, that have been expressed by a number of, of, of chairpersons about the operation of all party groups or APGs. I know most members in this House will be members of at least one all party group and are aware of some of the, the positive work that many all party groups can do. But uh, I also recognise that there are concerns uh, relating to the, number of, uh, the growth of the number of APGs and how this could impact potentially upon committee business. I think what is important to say is that. Members who are members of all party groups have a responsibility to ensure that the work of those all party groups do not impact upon official committee business. Uh, members of all party groups have a responsibility of ensuring that there is no clash in terms of when they are meeting or that the work that they do does not interfere with, with official committee business. Um, the report also refers to allegations um, which have, have happened in other places around all party groups, and I am sure we are all aware of the considerable media attention that has been focused, particularly at Westminster and all party groups. I am not sure any of us in this House have been offered such glamorous holidays with any association that we have here, but nevertheless it is a concern that, that I know the media have picked up on and therefore the public will quite rightly ask um, what the situation is here in, in Northern Ireland. Uh, and the report also claims that the secretarial uh, support for all party groups is not member-led and that this can lead to issues around transparency, agenda setting and the control of access to all party groups. Um, first of all, can I say that I welcome the fact that the Committee on Standards and Privileges will be asked to look at this. As a committee, we have always been open to having issues referred to us uh, and of giving that uh, confidence to the Assembly that we will look at it. Um, on the issue of uh, the number of APGs, uh, currently uh, our committee have to approve the creation of all party groups. Uh, I am not sure whether it would be the appropriate committee um, to, to prevent an all party group if it meets the current criteria, uh, but it is something that we would be keen to look at. Uh, and I can pledge to, to do that. Um, I think it is also important, however, Mr. Speaker, to make clear what the current provision is uh, and perhaps provide some reassurance to the uh, Assembly. Uh, we have already in place more robust measures in relation to all party groups uh, in Northern Ireland at the Northern Ireland Assembly when compared to, to Westminster. And it is a result of the changes in 2010 to the current rules on APGs, as indeed has been. Uh, acknowledged uh, at paragraph 150 of this report. Prior to the introduction of these rules, membership of all party groups was also open to outside individuals and organisations, but since then, membership of APGs has been limited to only Assembly members. In making this change, the Committee on Standards and Privileges wanted to ensure that all party groups could not be used by outside parties in a way that would either be uh, inappropriate or indeed undemocratic. The current rules do allow for outside organisations and individuals to attend all party group meetings and to inform and support their work. Whether and how this is done is a matter for each individual all party group to agree. However, just to be clear, any such organisation or individual who is invited to attend or support an all party group meeting cannot be regarded as a member of that APG and cannot vote at any meeting on any issue. It is also the case that the secretariats to all party groups have no powers. The only role that they have is the role given to them by the MLAs on that group, and this means that the issue of transparency, agenda setting and control of access to an all-party group are already matters which rest firmly in the hands of the MLAs who sit on that group. And I think there is a responsibility upon MLAs of this House to ensure that they do assert that authority when it is, is needed. I have heard anecdotally of, of perhaps some concerns over uh, certain groups monopolising all party groups, and it is up to the members of those groups to, to 
ensure that that does not happen, and I would hope that that is the case. It is permissible for all party groups to receive financial support or material benefits from outside interests, provided that that benefit is properly registered and its receipt in no way breaches the advocacy rule. And I would hope that all members in this House are aware of the, uh, the, the Code of Conduct, the, uh, the, the, the statutes that are on the books at present, and, and how we have to register those things. And the Assembly, of course, maintains a, a publicly accessible register of all party groups which sets out any benefits which, uh, which have been received by the group. And it includes details of the secretarial support provided to all party groups by third parties. I do not want to preempt the, the outcome of any discussions that our committee would have, um, but I think it is important to put, put out on record the steps that have already been taken around all party groups, uh, and I look forward to examining this closer uh, as part of the, all, the, the Committee on Standards and Privileges. Alwyn McGuinness. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. And could I say that um, uh, Lord George uh, said that uh, a camel uh, was a horse designed by a committee? So the question before us today is: Do we produce camels or do we produce horses? And I am certain that all of us want to produce horses. Uh, the question, therefore, arises: Is do we have the capacity to do that, and have we the resources to assist us in doing that? And I think that this is, therefore, a very timely debate uh, to examine uh, the effectiveness of our committee system. Uh, now, I believe that our committee system is work, uh, the architecture of the committee system is uh, as good as it's going to get. Uh, we do have quite considerable powers if we. Uh, use those powers. I don't think that we've used them particularly well, uh, but nonetheless, those powers are there, and we can use them. But I think what is required, uh, uh, Mr. Speaker, is uh, a good look at ourselves, and this report is doing that. Uh, but uh, looking at our own individual uh, professional capacities as representatives of the people here in this house, uh, how well. Uh, do we use our time, for example, on committees? And I think that we uh, could, could use our time much better. And I, I, I note that in the Detty Committee, of which I was a member for a long time, the best committee in the House, as, as you will know, uh, Mr. Speaker, and it may well remain the best committee in the House, despite the fact I'm not on it, I don't know. But nonetheless, uh, that committee has looked at how it times those who want to give evidence to the committee, and the timings for those who wish to uh, uh, ask questions and interrogate uh, those witnesses. And I think that's a very important and very basic step, but it's very helpful. In this, in this chamber, we normally have five minutes to speak, and I think that's a good uh, discipline. And we all fall into that discipline. Uh, and within committees, if we're given a minute or two minutes to ask questions, maybe that would be uh, a, a much more effective way of us using our time uh, and that capacity that we've got. And I want to pay tribute, Mr. Speaker, to Politics Plus. I think they, they, they're doing a tremendously good job for us as legislators. Very, very helpful in terms of our techniques and so forth. And uh, long may that continue, Mr. Speaker. I think it improves the quality uh, of us as, as uh, representatives. Uh, in particular uh, on committees and elsewhere as well. Uh, but could I also uh, finally say that resources are very important. And our biggest single resource, uh, Mr. Speaker, are our staff. And I think that, that our staff service our committees extremely well. But I do detect that we are stretching our staff too far. Uh, and that we are perhaps overloading the staff, uh, overburdening our staff, and I think that that arises from the constraints that we have here in terms of budget. The cap that we have, for example, on the recruitment of staff, and I, I know that the Commission has, uh, I hope I'm not straying too far, Mr. Speaker, but I know that the Commission has uh, agreed a policy of capping uh, staff. Now, that is all very well in theory, but in practice, it leads to problems. Uh, it leads, leads to problems in terms of resource management within committees and within this Assembly as a whole. I think, 
and this is a personal view, it's not a party view, but I think we should look at uh, those budgetary constraints again. I think we should look at uh, the cap that we have on recruitment of staff, because that will give us the flexibility, Mr Speaker, that is necessary to fill in those gaps, to reduce the burdens uh, and overstretching of our staff. And I, I, I would invite colleagues uh, to consider those points uh, afresh. Um, I think the time uh, for those uh, constraints uh, has um, passed, and I think we should look afresh at that. And I believe that that uh, would help us in terms of good resources and producing the horses that we want to produce instead of the camels that unfortunately may uh, be produced from time to time. John McAllister. Mr. McAllister. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Um, uh, and uh, I agree with Mr. McGuinness. We certainly all want to be producing horses and, uh, and not camels. Um, to, to use some other quotes, it's no surprise to members that um, I'm in favour of having a proper opposition here. And hopefully, within time, when this House would pass the, uh, my private members' bill, we will have that. Because, as Benjamin Disraeli once said, no government can be long secure without a formidable opposition. And here, this is one of the concerns I have over this report, is that uh, uh, currently the main uh, structure of opposition in this Assembly is our committees. Um, and I do think there are things that we should be doing uh, better, changing, looking at much better, um, to make them as effective as possible. We have identified some of the weaknesses of the structures. Uh, Mr McGlone, in uh, his contribution, talked about the Assembly and the Executive uh, needing to have a conversation almost. To me, Mr Speaker, we should remember who the Executive are accountable to that the Executive are accountable to this House. They are actually all part of this House, and we should not lose sight of effectively who works for who in this setup. And we should always remember that uh, the rights of, of committees and of backbenchers uh, in this Assembly, uh, and the, the Executive are to be held accountable to them and uh, to report to this House. And we often see that and we see examples from committees of failure for officials to turn up and almost a contempt for the committee structure and at times Mr Speaker ministers that uh, do not either turn up or respond to debates or late re um, replies to questions I think all show a, a contempt for the assembly that should not be tolerated that um, uh, other assemblies other parliaments throughout um, the, the UK and indeed these islands would not tolerate that. And I think we should not accept a, at times a, a second rate service. We expect this Assembly to function and to hold all of the executive um, to account. I do think that there are other things around committee structures that would be helpful. When we, we do eventually start to look at a proper opposition here and when more parties buy into that concept. We need to look about how the chairmanships um, of, of those committees are given out, because I think there is a strong argument that opposition parties would have more chairmanships in that they would to, to really add to that scrutiny. I also have to, to state, uh, Mr Speaker, that the chair of the Public Accounts Committee, even uh, as we speak with the current structure, should not, should not come from a, a government party. It should be from one of the, the opposition benches. It should be from a non-executive party. Um, I have to say, Mr Speaker, that um, Sinn Féin did get into some difficulties um, at a time with uh, having the chair of the Public Accounts Committee and doing an inquiry into um, Northern Ireland water. And that is one of the, uh, a classic example of why the, the chair of the public accounts, especially a committee so pivotal at, at holding different public bodies to account, why they should not be from parties in the executive. And I think that's key to doing this. Also, um, during the debate, people have mentioned said the work of, of Politics Plus and bringing um, outsiders in to help um, with, with training and building up capacity of, of members and of committees. I think one of the, um, the, the events that um, Politics Plus had run was 
a session on looking uh, the way the Scottish uh, Parliament work and that every bill in the Scottish Parliament goes through um, part of it's referred to the financial committee, the financial memorandum. And it did actually look at how detailed the financial memorandum were in legislation in the Scottish Parliament compared to the Northern Ireland Assembly. And I think the standards there, those are all things, Mr. Speaker, that we should be looking at to lift really um, the work and uh, working knowledge of the, of the Assembly and of the, its committee structure. And that committees are not just there um, to sort of nod compliantly when their minister is before them, that they are there and charged with a scrutiny role. And I think that's why Members there are some aspects of this report that are a missed opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Jim Allister. Thank Mr. Allister. Uh, we're told that this committee worked for six months. Six months to produce nothing. If they laboured for six months, what have they produced? No change. Uh, Mr. McGuinness talked about um, did we want a horse or did we want a camel? Well, I'm afraid we didn't even get a mouse. Not even a mouse that squeaks. Because there's not a squeak in this report about change. Now, of course, that is no surprise. Because the vested interest right round this house is for inertia and no change. Oh, yes, it's very, very fine when it comes to election time to produce manifestos that talk about reducing departments from to six to eight, to talk that by 2015, as the DUP manifesto talked about, we would have to have an assembly reduced to 80 members. Here we are halfway through, and nothing, and no prospect, and no desire, no vision for change. Because I repeat the point, the inertia, the status quo, suits the vested interests of this House. And the chairman uh, 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 who chaired this committee comes and tells us about we don't need any legislative change about these committees. They're doing a fine scrutiny role. I suggest it's time he, he read the legislation. Because he would discover, if he did, that these committees, these statutory committees, have no scrutiny role. Yes, the Belfast Agreement, for all of its many, many faults, in paragraph 9 and strand 1, promised there would be scrutiny committees. But when it came to the 1998 Act and section 29, conveniently, the designation of scrutiny is dropped, and we establish committees simply with the statutory ambit of to advise and assist the minister. So far from being scrutiny committees that might dare to challenge, they are there, their statutory purpose is specified to advise and assist the minister. Again, part of the same vested interest. So even the teeth that was in the committees in the Belfast Agreement had to be pulled by the time it came to the legislation. So a little wonder that this House generally is held in such public contempt. A little wonder that poll after poll illustrates that the people who are supposed to be serving in the community have little time for this House, have little regard for this House, hold it in abject contempt on many, many issues. When this House is very complacent and happy to have its own arrangements unaltered, even though they are not working with the community out there. And again, it's that vested interest. Mr. McAllister rightly raised the point about the Public Accounts Committee. Can anyone tell me of another legislator in the Western world where a government MLA chairs the Public Accounts Committee. It is standard practice across the democratic world that someone from outside the government parties chairs the Public Accounts Committee. But oh no, you couldn't have that in Stormont. 
Oh no, that might threaten the institutions. Oh no, that might threaten the process. And so let's sacrifice even that basic, modicum, modest idea of scrutiny by ensuring that even the Public Accounts Committee is chaired by someone who can be relied upon because they are a government member in terms of belonging to a government party. That's how bad it is in terms of the construction of this house. So I regret the fact, but I will not pretend Time's to be surprised that no change is the order of the day because no change is what the vested interest of this house requires. Thank you. Robin Swan, Deputy Chair of the Committee, to conclude the debate. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. It is clear from the debate that we have had or just heard that there has been value in bringing this issue to the floor of the House. It has provided all our members, not just the members of the committee review group or the members of the government parties, as Jim referred to, with an opportunity to look at whether our committee system is fit for purpose and also where further improvements can be made to enhance the effectiveness of committees in undertaking their key policy, consultation, legislative and scrutiny roles. Mr Allister, I know you referred to the, the scrutiny matter or the ability not being within the committee, but I have chaired the Employment and Learning Committee. And to put yourself down the glad that you did not scrutinise ministers or department officials, I think you're doing yourself a disservice, as well as many other members in this House. And I've sat in a number of committees, Mr Speaker, where they have been able to scrutinise and do scrutinise and hold ministers and their officials to account. I welcome the recommendations and the reports which provide a useful focus for committees to achieve the vision set out in this report, that this Assembly should have an outstanding, progressive and resource system that enhances the capacity and effectiveness of statutory and standing committees in delivering their statutory and other functions. I also welcome and endorse the group's main conclusion that the direct link between each executive department and its corresponding statutory committee as is, is at the heart of the committee system. It has been identified, Mr Speaker, as a key strength that should be retained. And I hope that wasn't some of the changes that were being referred to earlier on. We had the discussion within the group that we could move to thematic committees, cross-arching committees. But we felt one of the strengths that we had in here, and one of the strengths that was enshrined from the Belfast Agreement, was that each committee reflected directly to its minister and was able to hold them accountable if the membership was willing and if the membership was able. It provides committees with opportunities, not enjoyed to the same degree in other legislators, to provide that direct oversight of a department which leads to focused and, importantly, effective scrutiny. The committee review group concluded that the committee stru structure should remain as it is. As outlined by the chair of the committee review group, also regarded as equally important to retain committee membership at 11, as this is in the broad proportion of party strengths and as is at the heart of the Belfast Agreement and is also covered in the standing orders from 46 to 64 C. Mr Speaker, one of the key debates that was had was committee membership, and we looked, I know Alban referred to the time constraints put on members, but we looked at all sorts of models by reducing the number of memberships on committees, and unfortunately those who had lost out were the members from the non-executive parties. So as, ex as the committee review group thought it was important and crucial that we kept our committee membership at 11 so that all members in this House had the opportunity to hold committee seats. Mr Speaker, come as, as the Ulster Unionist representative on that committee, I also strongly support the view that the committees have sufficient powers. However, has been a, having been a member of a committee since 2011 and a chair of the Employment and Learning Committee, I think it's fair to say that committees do not always make the most of their powers, and that committees should consider how they can use the powers more effectively, and that's referred to in point 11 of the report. Committees have the ability to call peoples and persons and also shouldn't be always at the request of who the department or who the minister wants to send. And as committees and as committee chairs, we should be making sure we use the most of that ability. I will now refer in more detail to some of our other members' contributions. The chair highlighted the fact that the CRG was content with the architecture of the committee system and the structures and the numbers on the number of members. I have already alluded to this along with the reasons why CRG wished to see no changes to the structures of the committee system. However, Mr. Maskey also made 
the point that there would be merit in revisiting these structures issues in 2015 in advance of the anticipated changes in 2016 with the reorganisation of departments and should there be a reduction in members and also as Mr McAllister referred to should there be a position or a provision for an opposition that is the correct time for putting those procedures in place not now he also pointed out that one consequence of making no major structural changes was that they placed limits on the scope and extent of other proposals that it could be made at last time. While proposing no extension to committee powers, he also pointed out that committees were not making the most of their powers, and that came through from a number of our speakers that were rep represented here. And that's a key important fact of the role of a chairman and some of the chair chairperson of the chairperson's liaison group that I intend to take forward. The chair people should be using and making sure that committees do make the most of those powers. However, this has to be viewed within the context of limited resources. For example, members find themselves overstretched, having to deal with committing demands of their time, including heavy committee work programmes, multiple membership of committees, party and constituency work. But one of the key roles of an MLA is to be on a committee. And that is as important as speaking in this House, the constituency work, we're members of a legislative assembly. And that legislation comes in front of the committees as well as this House, and that's where our role should be. Added to these demands, Michelle McElveen referred to the growth in the all-party groups, and that was supported by Alistair Ross and his contributions. And just that we do have to be careful that all-party groups are managed, don't conflict with the work of the committees, or have invested interest in certain issues. And I think that's something that the standards and privileges have promised to look on. And I welcome the chairman's comments that he's going to take that on and made that pledge to us, because it is their role to register all all party groups that are brought before this House. So that provision is already there. Anna Lowe referred to the improvements in strategic planning and as another way of making the most out of committee resources as a vital and important tool that all committees should be using because day and daily each committee will receive a request to either go to a visit or have another meeting or have another evidence session. And unless that proper structure is put in place, Prior to that, you could end up with a workload that gets run away from the committee, and it doesn't serve any purpose. Patsy McGlone outlined the measures to improve committee resources and also raised a very important point, and that was the late delivery of requested papers, and especially in regards to budgets. And he also referred, I think, the phrase that Patsy used was that official, officials move on. I think what he didn't also refer to was that sometimes officials are moved on by certain ministers, so they don't come in front of certain committees as well. So we should have and use that ability to call all peoples and powers. Mr. Speaker, uh, Mr. Hilditch welcomed the expanded role specifically under recommendations 31 and 32, and that was the acceptance of the role of the audit committee. And the chairman is currently in Westminster looking at that at this moment in time. So to say this report is produced nothing, I think, is unfair and unjust, Mr. Speaker, because there are recommendations in there that will move us forward. Again, Alban Refuge referred to the architecture and the support and the structure that we have. The capping of staff, I think, Mr Speaker, I know Mr McGuinness sought to make sure he wasn't straying too far, but as chairperson of the chairperson's liaison group, I am willing to raise that matter with the Commission, because the last thing any organisation needs, the last thing any business needs, is demotivated staff, and we can't afford to have that in this assembly or on our committees because our staff are crucial to the work that we do. And I would like to take this point to pay tribute to the staff who worked through the different requests that all the members put in this and also our outside um, experts that come in to advise us on how things worked in different places. And I think one of the things that was pointed out was um, in another place, Mr Speaker, south of the border, they referred to how they've changed their committee structures time and time again to now actually where they're in the position, they're in the same structure they were 10 years ago, and everybody thinks it's great. So, you know, producing the camel instead of the horse is, can be a never-evolving process where we end up with neither. Uh, Mr Speaker, in regard, uh, John McAllister referred to the, the failure of ministers not showing in this House and to late questions. Unfortunately, that did not fall under the remit of this committee. But I know, speaking as a party rep and as a, as a, chair, a chairman of the Employment and Learning Committee, it is a concern that this House hasn't been shown that respect, and I know it's, it's something you have taken on as well. Mr. Chairman, I, or Mr. Speaker, I look forward to looking at the recommendations in more detail in both my capacity as chair of the Chairperson's Liaison Group and chair of the Employment and Learning Committee. 
I support the notion that committees ultimately should maintain their own autonomy and determine their own priorities, but also agree that committees should strive to adopt work practices that continually improve and enhance the effectiveness of committees by striving to provide an outstanding, progressive and resource system in the interests of the people of Northern Ireland. Mr Speaker, I commend this report to the House. Okay. Order members, the question is the motion standing on the order appropriately agreed. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Can't you have any noes? No. The ayes, I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it.